Welcome, episode two of Hashbang TV. Episode two. We are still here, <laughs> and we're still pumping out quality content. Yes, yeah, you haven't managed to get rid of us yet. No. So, okay, so what are we going to be talking about this week? Uh, so we have uh, Joe Rabin coming in, who's one of the founders and organisers of Mobile Monday London, so that should be interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about the news from uh, Apple about um, their payments to developers. Uh, $4 billion, right? So Have far. been paid out? I'm counting. Excellent. And we'll probably round off on just chatting through the, uh, the kind of current situation with RIM and the announcement of their new CEO. So that's kind of what this show looks like. Any thoughts from kind of last week? No, not really. Very happy. Yeah. It was so much more of an improvement on the preview show. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think... Um, Hopefully this is going to get better each week as we learn little kind of tips. We've got multiple cameras now. <laughs> More we've got, cameras. We're in a room full of cameras and tripods. Not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, you know, we're investing. <laughs> oh, and the other development is we're on iTunes, right? We are. So you're obsessed with audio. I love audio, video. So yeah. Tell, tell everyone why we're now launching a podcast. Some of the feedback we got was that people, because it's quite long form, you know, 40 minutes or so, some people wouldn't sit there watching it on the screen. Uh, so we've just cut the audio and created it into a podcast. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, it works. You can just listen to us. You can download it, obviously. You can watch it offline. You can take hash bang on the train with you. There's now no excuse not to have us in your lives. Is that what, is that what <laughs> yeah. you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful voices. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that's syndicated on iTunes. You can go get it from there. Um, it's also on Podbean, so you can, you can listen to it from the blog directly, ashbang.tv. Lovely. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways to get it. Um, do you want to just, should we talk a little bit about the length of the shows as well? Because we've had yes. a bit of feedback about that as yeah, well. Yeah, we should, yeah. I mean, our initial intention, I suppose, was to produce one 15-minute video every two weeks. But we've recorded more than that each time. We have. <laughs> yeah. So, and the yeah. feedback was, "Whoa, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that it'll be, you know, not sure I'll be able to get through to the end." And da 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 da. But actually, we've decided to go long form, mm. and potentially to, you know, we're doing the audio thing as well. Mm -hmm. And if people continue to provide that feedback, we might extract the interviews and have those as standalone units. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we want to make this show successful, so we'll listen to the feedback. I mean. It's probably worth, if you've read the blog, I don't know if you've read the blog posts, but our inspiration for this show... Is it your blog? Not my blog. Oh, our blog. Our blog. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But I write all that as well, you know. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm try, still trying to figure out what you bring to this. <laughs> Handsome good looks. Oh, yeah. That's okay. what my mum it, says. It's that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, our in, one of our key inspirations for this was This Week in Startups, right? With yes. Jason and Tyler. Yes. And uh, if you check out their shows, uh, way more professional than us... But they're running to like two hours, mm. hour and a half, two hours. So we wanted to get the kind of feel of a proper show, right? Not just kind of a cat falling off a skateboard kind of five minute clip on YouTube, <laughs> even though it's about as interesting. <laughs> but Have you got any cats falling off skateboard videos? No, okay. but we can maybe do something like okay. that. Maybe we can go on location. Yeah. It's, so it's not, again, to reiterate what it's not, it's not supposed to be that serious analysis of... The tech world. I think they might have got that <laughs> if they've watched yeah. the first one. The original, the original idea was we have lots of conversations down the pub, you know, and they're funny, but it's about tech, so it's kind of supposed to be informative and fun, hmm. isn't it? That's the plan. That's the plan. Yeah, and hopefully, so. you know, it's going to be more guests, less us. Yes. That's that's the theory. Yeah. Insert joke about losing weight again. Yes. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Excellent. So one thing that caught my attention this week was um, the news that Apple has now made out payments to developers of four billion dollars. Um, pretty impressive. I mean, yep. obviously, you know, we want this show to go out to kind of entrepreneurs and developers that are trying to start their own businesses. So, I mean, you know, if you, if you're trying to set something up and you've got software, surely kind of the App Store route is going to be the no-brainer approach, right? You know the. Tons of money to be made with relatively little effort. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think I, it's so. The story says four billion to developers. Mm -hmm. A lot of that money has been paid out to professional organisations, 
publishers, game publishers. You know, they're not, you know, let's not pretend that these are two or three people in a room, you know, with no real business that have just chucked something up there and it's sold millions. That doesn't happen. That's a myth. So there's a lot of that four billion is content that existed before that's been repurposed into an application. But still, that's a fantastic market size for something which is a mobile application. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, anyone that's been in this kind of market for a while can remember pre-app store yeah. and trying to get your product in front of customers was pretty much impossible. You know, there's only one or two routes you had, one of those being the mobile operators, yep. which are, have always been difficult to deal with. Um, so, you know, the app stores coming along suddenly made it easy. You suddenly had an opportunity to reach people with your software. Indeed. But I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the kind of flip side of that because, you know, I think you're right. This can get overhyped. There are very few examples of actually the kind of, you know, rags to riches stories out there yeah. of small companies suddenly becoming rich. Um, you know, even Rovio is obviously always quoted with Angry Birds, but what was that, 50-odd product yeah, down the they'd line? Already re- yeah, they'd already... I remember playing Bounce on a Nokia communicator in the year 2000, you know. That was yeah. a Rovio product. Yeah. Um, th- th- what was that one called? Uh, was it the Free Mint or something? The Australian guys that did the aeroplane landing. Do you remember that game? One of the original uh, uh, yeah, yeah. App- game applications. That was a rags... Not rags to riches, but there were a small team... In an Australian, I think they were in Sydney, yeah. you know, in a, in a in a small office, and and they ported it early, and they got lots and lots of revenue from it. So it does happen. It does happen. It's just yeah. not. It's overstated in the media how yeah. often it is. And and what about now that you know maybe in the early days, maybe three or four years ago, you had an opportunity to get into the app store early, build some momentum, yeah. get into the top kind of twenty of the all category. That seems to be the secret of driving tons of traffic, sure, right? Once yeah. you're into that top 20. Yeah. But now, what, six, well, 500,000, 600,000 apps out there, you know, it, I think it's interesting from my perspective is, you know, you, the gold rush is over. You're now probably competing with at least two or three apps that do very similar things. Yes. So you need to start thinking about, I guess, almost traditional marketing techniques, right? You can't just write a cool app and throw it out there anymore and expect it to sell. Yeah. You need to think about who your competitors are, what your kind of unique selling points are versus your comp- your, your competitors, you know? Yeah. Um, pricing, you know, how you kind of sit alongside your competition. Um, testing with customers, you know, making sure before you release your software, you've been through that kind of iteration cycle with getting real feedback, not just testing it with your mates, actually trying to find yeah. real people on the street to give you honest and open feedback. So even though some of these things might sound quite dull and quite businessy and boring, if you've got 600,000 apps and you want to cut through, you're going to have to start thinking about these things. Yeah. You're right, it is traditional marketing um, and you need to you know, you need to create landing pages which are optimized for mobile in case people are clicking through from somebody else's recommendation with direct links to the app stores. And that could be, you know, it could be Android, it could be Windows, it could be iPhone. And then, you know, you can do all sorts of things to improve that flow. It can be automatic based on the the device that's accessing it. So that it just presents the correct app store link for you. Um, So yeah, there's loads of startups as well, isn't there? Tapjoy is an example of where they're trying to, you know, add some kind of directory or, or discovery mechanism on top of the app store itself. So from within apps and from the web, and driving that so yeah it, it is traditional marketing of this stuff because it, it's it's very well populated in all categories now so I mean so what's your opinion of the kind of tactics of something like the FT like Financial Times hmm. you know they've actually gone the complete opposite right and they've, they've withdrawn their apps from the app stores and they've gone like a, a native HTML5 route um, do you think I mean my take on that is you know obviously very few people have got the brand um, impact of an FT and they have they have a fairly you know um, what's the word I'm looking for they have a fairly good community that they can directly talk to yeah. through the paper yeah. through their existing channels so they can promote the fact that you can go and get your app even though it's not in the app store they're not necessarily relying on ch- people discovering it almost accidentally through an app store sure. so do you think that method could work for smaller companies or do you think they are going to be tied into the app stores going forward <laughs> it's, really, it's a really it's a really good question this whole thing um, Everybody talks about the FT, and I think that's the best implementation of a so-called HTML5 mobile app. Um, do you remember the Grosch adverts from the 90s? You know, it's not ready yet. I don't think the technology is ready yet. HTML5. Yeah, for, for specifically for web apps, if you want to do stuff that's 
slightly more complicated. So they've got the caching sorted, right? So a lot yeah. of that textual information is is cached yeah. in, in in your browser. Um, and so, you know, page transitions and things like that work really well. Twitter's another good example. If you go to the mobile um, the mobile app on the, in the browser of Twitter, uh, for Twitter, then, you know, you get a certain amount of functionality. But I don't, my experience with an iPhone and also on my Android device, it's not ready yet. Mm. It, it doesn't really work. And, and I, I just think that the app stores are the right place to go. You've got that categorization. Um, it makes it more viral. People will share those links more than a more than a standard URL. It's strange. It's just there is this this sort of unwritten thing. There's something nice about going to the app store and downloading it. There's something nice about that process. It feels like a purchase process, even if the app is free. Yeah. It feels like you're doing something, and I think that's powerful. And I guess there's been loads of research because we've been talking about this subject for years and years now. Um, so I'm very positive. I think that I think that if you had Similar functionality, uh, and, and you know, an application was in the store, and an application was a uh, was a uh, at th- at this point in time, HTML5. I think the user experience would be better as a native app because of those things. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you like us go to a lot of conferences, a lot of events, and HTML versus HTML5 versus native app oh. just seems to dominate every talk that we go to. And yeah. I, I, personally, who gives a shit? I mean. I'm coming at it from the customer perspective, mm. right? The consumer perspective, the guy that's actually using the application on the phone. Why do I care if the app has been written in HTML5 or it's native? All it, I'm interested in is the experience, the content, what it's doing for me. This is when it will be ready. When you don't care, when you can't tell, and I, and I mean applications that are that you know that use um, things like PhoneGap. Which is you know HTML5, JavaScript, CSS in the background with the app Chrome around it. Mm-hmm. Um, when you can't tell, it'll have made it. But right now you can. You know if you try and use the Twitter application, the FT application compared to the native versions of those, it's you can tell the difference. You can absolutely tell. So from a user point of view, it's not there yet. So are we going to talk about apps versus HTML5? We just have for two minutes. Yeah, that's yeah. So we, we've broken our own golden rule there. We yeah, should, yeah. yeah. But but it, but I, th- I think well, it's have you not got your sound effect? No. We need a clang or something. Well, for that as well as yeah, when yeah. you talk about the blog. Uh, the blog. Yeah. No. Okay. That was last week. So we'll try not to talk about this, unless of course you want us to talk about this. But yeah, I just find the whole thing so overdone and pointless. It's uh, yeah. It's one of those things. But four billion is an interesting number. And oh yeah. I, and, and and so to go to, to talk about a slightly different subject, you know, people talk about the reach of Android, and it's obvious that the number of devices that have been shifted that run the Android operating system is huge and dwarfs um, iOS completely. Mm. Uh, but the willingness for people to pay for content. So if you're interested in reach, then HTML5 or Android. That's the way. That's definitely the way to go. And of course, with all of this advice, you're going to do everything. You're going to get it on as many yeah, well, platforms as you can afford to do at the right quality level. That's that's the caveat there. You know, a lot of software shops can't afford to support every platform, so they have to make choices, right? Sure. They should go check out Developer Economics. Yeah, they should. They should. We'll put that a link up there. Yeah, we should. But um, but I think that's really interesting that Android has this huge reach, but the people that consume media, the people that will purchase an app or buy a subscription they tend to they tend to have gathered around the iOS ecosystem mm. they trust the payments you know and, and we've talked about this before as well Amazon have that opportunity to compete with Android with their own store and also with the Kindle Fire you know they can deliver content services that could compete with Apple so that I think you know there's it's just fascinating how everything's sort of lining up uh, it's a real battle it's something that we all think about you know, if you're if you're starting a business and you've got certainly an application-based business, um, it, it, you have to think about all this stuff, and it's become really common to talk about it. A few years ago, people talk about mobile platforms. Now, now it's like it's like a common question. I hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. It's nice to have a good answer, but you do sound like an Apple fanboy though when you give them that answer. But yeah. it, I, I think economically it, it stacks up, which is the, which is this news article about the the four billion yeah. outpayments. You know, I'd love to see the Android stats on that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we may come back to that topic. Who knows? We'll see how things go. But uh, yeah, interesting. Cool. Okay, we're joined by Joe Rabin from Mobile Monday London. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. So, can you give us a little bit of background? What have you done in your career around mobile and technology before you got involved with Mobile Monday? 
Well, it goes back quite a long way, actually. Um, I was at Reuters for a very long time, did uh, a number of roles there. And back in about 2000, I got the opportunity to become CTO of Reuters Mobile, which um, was kind of like a dream ticket, actually, because uh, I would have always been interested in doing the stuff that's just about to break. And we thought that mobile was about to break in 2000. Well, it's taken a little bit longer than that, hasn't it? So after that, I went on to become CTO at Flowformatic, and then I went on to work at Dotmobi, became CTO there. And during the course of all this involvement with mobile, I uh, hooked up with Dan Applequist, who originally had the idea to bring Mobile Monday to London. Excellent, excellent. So what were you, how did mobile, uh, how did the WW3C stuff happen with mobile then? What sort of period of time were we talking about? Well, that was back in 2005, okay. actually. And Dotmobi was um, started by a range of um, industry players who wanted to capitalise use of the mobile web. And um, you can see Dotmobi as a number of things, but it was a catalyst for, uh, or a, a forum, I think, in, in which a number of naturally non-cooperating entities yeah. could come together and say, look, it's in all of our interests to try and get this thing to happen. And part of that story was to say, well, what does it mean to have a mobile website? Mm. And uh, the W3C Mobile Web Initiative was a, I have to say, slightly belated um, effort on the part of W3 to say, well, to answer some of those questions. And we spent a good long time writing uh, uh, the mobile web best practices, mobile web applications best practices, mm. mobile like tests. I could go on, but uh, I won't. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, there were quite a lot of. Um, Racks and documents that uh, we wrote there. So, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure a lot of the viewers of this show would have been to a mobile Monday and, and you've probably met them and they'll know you very well. But I guess for the benefit of the people that haven't, could you give us a flavour of how Mobile Monday has grown in London? Um, because now I think you're pulling in something like, you know, 250 to 400 people for every one of the events you've done. So, I guess you know, if you can give us a flavour of how that's grown and, and how London compares across the world with other MoMOs, that'd be quite interesting, I think. Okay, I'll give you some stats, James. Try and keep it brief, Mark. I could roll them off for you if you Okay. Like. Um, Pop quiz on Mobile Monday. <laughs> yes, who is the third person ever? <laughs> Who's the person outside of the organisers who's attended most events? So I believe it's David Wood, actually. Ah, ah right. So yeah. Much yeah. credit to David for yeah. that. Um, so Mobile Monday itself started uh, roughly in 2000 in Helsinki. And um, this was a bunch of guys who got together in a pub basically said, we need to start talking about this. And um, it carried on like that, I believe, in Helsinki until about 2005. In fact, November 2005 was when we started in London. We were one of the first outside of Helsinki. Right. And I remember our first event very, very well, actually. We held it at uh, Vodafone's offices in the Strand. Mm -hmm. Capacity was 100. We had 250 yeah. registrations. So we knew that there was a demand for, mm. for something. The event so, was... So it's always been a fair scale, then? It, it never kind of was two people had, in a pub? We had absolutely no idea <laughs> right. at the time. And, uh, so the word went out virally. Yeah. And um, folks just signed up on... Um, a little form. I mean, I don't know about you, but it always <clears throat> strikes me as quite weird when you hear people like Eric Schmidt saying that mobile is the most important thing, or, or Zuckerberg, or someone like that, right? So you've had this band of people that have been believers in mobile for nearly a decade, and now suddenly we're here, and all the web companies are going, it's all about mobile. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a weird flip. Uh, I think it is funny. But long overdue. Um, <clears throat> it's starting to sound like a granddad, though, aren't we? Well, yeah, we're all but, old, You know, we? we were there at the start and so on and so forth. It's GPRS, just, GPRS it's just, is it's the just, future. It, everybody is interested in mobile. Every every single business, small, medium and huge, they have to have a mobile presence. Uh, absolutely. I think it's an absolute necessity. And I think that um, I find it quite shocking, really, when there are some sectors, retail is, I think, quite a good example, where they're just not getting the fact that people are walking out of their expensive physical real, real estate because they're doing comparison shopping. This is something that they should be turning to their advantage and something that could be turned to their advantage uh, in a massive kind of way but just isn't. So I think equally you could say publishers are probably fully on board with the idea, yes, mobile, have they done enough about it yet? I don't think they mm. have. Um, my background at Reuters says there's a lot more 
that can be done in the publishing space with mobile. Absolutely. But I think, as I was saying, that there is a more fundamental question, which is, is mobile a meaningful categorization today? Does, does anybody really care no. what the transmission technology is? But it's not. It's the device now, isn't it? It's got nothing to do with the network that the content is served across. It's the, the form factor of the, the piece of technology I, I, you're interacting with, and that's that's still got to be called mobile. I I don't disagree with you, Chris. I, <laughs> I think you are. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I became notorious at W three C for saying I don't disagree, but. <laughs> Uh, I don't Most people with do disagree with him. Yeah, right. yes. and I'm always right. Um, I, the form factor is obviously a factor, but I think that the um, the key determining thing here is that we have a range of form factors. We have a range of bandwidths. We've got a range of delay characteristics. But most importantly, well, I believe what characterises what we do today is that we are doing contextual computing rather than mobile computing or any other type of computing. And it is about the varying range of devices, and I totally agree with the form factors in the video. I also yeah. think, yeah, it's kind of important to know whether someone is on a rather thin 3G straw or whether they're on a rather fat Wi-Fi or whatever. In practice, there's very little way of finding that out in real time. But being aware of that is, is, um, is the core to providing the services that we're interested in today. So I would prefer uh, to call these things um, Contextually aware than yeah. on mobile, but since I've got the latest. It's not as snappy as Momo, though, is it? No, Momo is <laughs> Momo's good, and we will remain mobile and we'll remain on Monday, I guess. Uh, so, so, do you see the kind of evolving, kind of, I guess, mission, if you like, of Momo London as, as well as kind of bringing the community together to kind of network and to do business, but also to help educate other sectors? You know, you mentioned retail, you know, do you, do you see that as part of the mission to, to try to evangelize the, the need to think about mobile contacts with those guys? Yes, very much so, James. I mean, I think actually the mix going back to that point has changed since when we started, which was there were lots of people who were very thirsty to know about mobile mm. and lots of keen people who wanted to know more. And we did quite a lot of lecture, sort of um, 20 minute presentation mm, yeah. events where we'd run three uh, thematically coherent um, talks from knowledgeable people that people would learn. Um, move forward to today, it's very much more the case that the audience has got a very great degree of sophistication in mm. the technology, design, and other aspects of what they're doing. And our best events are those events where uh, the panel and the audience come together with sort of an exchange of ideas, almost a disagreement, Chris, every now and then. <laughs> I've been at the receiving end of that one. So. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, that's but that's healthy and that's yeah. good. Yeah. So I think it's actually more the former, actually, James, these days, where we see the mission as being connecting people, helping people with business agendas, right. rather than helping them with technology or design agendas. Clearly that comes into it. Yeah. And clearly that story is unfolding just as fast as it ever was, but more people are more on top of it. Uh -huh. And I think that the climate now has changed since 2005 very much. Mm. Our constituency isn't exclusively uh, developers, it's not exclusively SMEs or startups, but it is biased towards those uh, two sectors. Well, I mean, maybe we can um, backtrack and talk talk about the kind of the comparative size and uh, yeah. interest level in London versus international Momo because I mean Momo is everywhere now right 70 odd chapters maybe even more I'm not maybe up to date with the numbers but uh, it's difficult to track each chapter operates completely effectively independently of each other chapter yeah. all kinds of different agendas formats uh, different corporate I mean we are a limited company others are not yeah. right um, we are I would say almost certainly one of the most active and one of the most and one of the biggest in terms of membership. So yeah. very difficult to measure membership when we don't have membership cards. <laughs> um, I would say that if you took the gross um, reach that we have, it's almost certainly over twelve thousand people. Right. Um, it, it, it's very difficult to measure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So on the various channels. So we are quite big. Uh, we do events more frequently than most people do. We try to do events roughly every month. And I mean, obviously, we're keen to make the show about the UK and not just talk about London. Um, so obviously, Mobu is expanding across the UK as well, right? Can you give us some kind of insight in terms of that? Yes. Um, for some time, there's been a Mobu in Belfast, and that. Um, 
and Dublin and Belfast now work very, very closely with each other, um, and that's great. They did a, a very large event in Dublin. Edinburgh's been going for quite a while now, yeah. quite successful. Manchester started recently, last year. They've had a few events, and um, evidently they've been very good too. And Birmingham had its first event uh, just recently as well. Yeah. But that's, that's, broadly speaking, where we are in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we haven't reached out to the South West Coast. I think there's something there called uh, Open Can. Or... <laughs> yeah, that's not quite the same as Mobile Mondays, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and there are other places that are, could possibly be of interest. But, yeah. um, I think we're fortunate in London especially to have a particularly large mobile caucus. I would like to promote an agenda as UK being a premier mobile mm. place that London within the UK has the unique combination of technology, design, and business yeah, and advertising. skills to, yeah. make a, to make a virtuous environment. And I would love to see more of an agenda for that. That's partly why we're moving into the, um, the space of encouraging the business aspects. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. We're in the right place at the right time. So you, uh, it sounds like you would certainly endorse this kind of growing uh, recognition for London being a center for entrepreneurs, startups, technology, it, it feels like it's booming. So it sounds like you, you very much kind of, uh, you know, support that view. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, I really do think that there's lots of stuff happening here. So to wrap up then, what? So most of the people that watch this show are going to be developers or going to be uh, in small software startups, right? So what three things? Or our parents. Mainly, no yeah. offense. What three I things? <laughs> <laughs> so many jokes. <laughs> what three things does Mobile Monday London offer if you're a, if you're a developer, independent developer with startup ambitions around software and mobile? What, what, what can they come and get? What's that business opportunity? It's like that old estate agent from Chris. Location, location, location. <laughs> in our case, it's you've got to know people in yep. order to do business, and it's you know developers. I know, I'm an engineer, I'm a developer. The tendency is to say, I want to write code, I'm going to go tippy tappy on my computer, and I'm going to create great stuff. That's important and necessary, of course, but you've got to know the right people. You've got to meet people, you've got to talk to people, you've got to develop your skills in doing that. So it is about engagement, mm. it's about networking. Networking, networking, networking. Excellent. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? No, where can we find out more? On our website, which is mobilemonday.org.uk, mm -hmm. uh, that's our blog. Oh, I must give you the, also the plug, if I may, for um, Demo Night. We try to run Demo Night twice a year. I'll tell you what Demo Night is. Um, Demo Night is a showcase, a uh, curated showcase, I guess, where we will try to put about 16, usually smallish, but sometimes quite large organisations. Samsung and Intel have also participated, for example, so very large organizations uh, with a three-minute pitch and two-minute questions in front of an audience which is typically rather larger than usual so we'll get maybe 300 maybe 400 people who are just really keen to see what are the fresh typically these days app ideas yeah. that are coming out so, so when's demo night if demo we'll night will be either towards the end of march or april okay uh, we'll, we'll link up to that as well yeah yeah and <coughs> we'll give that a shout out as, as it comes closer as well great Perfect. Good stuff. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Really it's appreciate really it. Thanks, James. guys. Okay. Nice one. Bye. Okay, so uh, other news then that's kind of just come out is uh, the change of CEO at RIM. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess a question in its own right is: should is this important? Should we be talking about this? Yes, definitely. It's a big story. It's an interesting story. I think uh, startups and developers are interested. They've obviously been a big player in mobile for a long time. Uh, and, and I think the interesting part of the story is that they've gone from two CEOs to one CEO, a different one. Yeah. Uh, and I think one is the right number when it comes to CEOs. So who's the CEO of this? Uh, hmm. Two. You. Two. You. Me? Well, yeah, I think you are. But then we're not a trillion dollar company so not no, yet anyway not maybe yet. next year so I, th I think it is interesting i think from a it's a bit like the nokia burning platform stuff right the the popular uh consensus about rim and and, and their blackberry products is that they're on a bit of a downward spiral they've lost their core business um and they're very strong in this kind of youth sector with blackberry yeah. messenger and stuff like that they needed to change mm -hmm. uh, and the developers that i speak to 
the problem they've got is there's a multitude of platforms. They've they've got yeah, legacy. Yeah, yeah. They've got legacy with these devices. So this new CEO love it or hate it what Nokia have done is they focused on one platform and that makes it easier if you're a developer you want to know that the tools are there you know it's fragmented right now yeah. and, and you speak to the developer relations guys at RIM you know they know they've got a problem in their hands trying to convince people because yeah. what do you do how do you know what Blackberry device people are using um, so uh, yeah you're, it's interesting you were at Hack Day this yeah. weekend right and, yeah. and you were talking to some guys and they were just saying you know there's too many choices, too many tools, too many platforms for BlackBerry. Yeah. And I guess if you're a small company, you can't build apps for every platform. So no. you have to make some choices. So should you be building for RIM at the moment? I think RIM isn't, well, I don't know about me, but generally RIM isn't being selected to, to, to be built for. So, I mean, but what I hear about the, the, the web-based platform um, that the, the they are pushing is that it's it's very good, it's very positive. Right. A HTML5 based environment. And when's that coming? Uh, well, I think it's available now for the playbook, and it will roll out across their platform. So this, if I'm getting it right, they were talking about um, BlackBerry 10 as yeah. the platform that will, you know, there there are there is no legacy after that, so things right. will run on there. Right. And, and and the developers I was speaking to, they're not, they weren't. Um, it's not as if they're new to this either. They had written RIM applications five, six, seven years ago in, yeah. in business. So um, I, I think they've been through the mill yeah. um, and so that's what this guy this new CEO he his job is to try and work out a way to to, to bring developers are so that, that's what's interesting about this story is developers are so important to companies yeah. now yeah. that's what's important about the RIM story is if they can't get developers to engage it's over. But that's very much what uh, Balmer said at Microsoft and also with Elon when he yep. moved to Nokia yep. Yep. he talked about you know Operators and developers being the the, key, the, the, the two key kind of That's constituents it. that you had to yeah. keep happy. So I'm lucky enough to be going to DevCon in Amsterdam next week. Yep. So uh, I don't know whether the new CEO, um, Thornston Hines, will be there. Um, I would have thought that would be an important gig for him, right? Because if developers yeah. are that important, they're running a huge, you know, a thousand developer event a in, in, in yeah. Amsterdam. Yeah, so DevCon Europe sold out. You know, so it's obviously still a traction there. Yeah. Um, so that so it'll be interesting to see what he says, and and I'll be uh, on a stand talking to developers, finding out what they think yeah. and what they need to do. So I, you know, hopefully I can come back and report back. But yeah, I, I, I think it is an important story. I mean, they again, they are a big player, hmm. um, and they seem to be in decline, and somebody needs to change that decline. But let's not. They're not out of cash. They've got a lot of cash yeah, there, yeah, yeah. and they've still got an opportunity to do stuff. But mobile is so cutthroat. You know, you've got Android and you've got iPhone leading the way. And we talked earlier about the differences between that in terms of reach versus revenue. Yeah. Um, and so when you talk about these other platforms and what opportunities there are, maybe there isn't enough room for four or five other platforms. So, you know, will will RIM BlackBerry be one of the things that goes by the wayside mm. or will they remain in, you know, in the ring, as it were, um, going forward? So okay. it's, it's an important story. So something to keep an eye on. And yeah, if you can come back and tell us what happened in Amsterdam. Will do. Awesome. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of another uh, episode of Hashbang TV, our second episode. We're still here. We're oh, yeah. still rocking on. Um, so last week, we, uh, we had some fun talking about cheese on toast and what's the right source of cheese on toast if you had to pick red or brown. Critical um, issues. And you came up with this brilliant phrase, the condiment Olympics. Mm. Um, and somebody, Kieran Guttridge, who's an avid watcher of our one episode... <laughs> Is um, he responsible for all the hits? He's one of our biggest fans. Uh, he's come up with an iPhone application called Condiment Olympics. Really? Yeah, I've seen an early demo of it. Okay. And uh, what it, all it does is it presents a food type yeah. and it has two buttons. Red or brown? Red or brown sauce. Awesome. Yeah. And depending on what you press, it gives you an abusive message or it says yay. Um, so he's going to develop that further. Thank you, Kieran. <laughs> and hopefully we can stick some content in there as well. Um, so when we're going to get that, we'll, we'll, so we'll keep everyone informed when they can go get that. Absolutely, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Ab nice. ab absolutely. Okay. Um, so yeah, he, he's go he's going to do that, uh, and it got me to thinking of other foods that yeah. you know. Uh, you need. You, it's you, your, are you on board it's your with idea. the cheese on toast thing, though? Well, is it, are I, you now on the brown camp? Or no, I'm not totally a red camp. But I'm not sure um, I can do this with you, to be honest. But, so, okay, so on, what's the scrambled answer? eggs on toast. Yeah. All right. So you've, you've had a big night out. Yeah. You wake up. You make a big pile you've of lost scrambled your eggs. Book on your big night out. I wasn't drunk. Okay. And uh, you've got a plate full of uh, scrambled eggs on toast. Yeah. First of all, microwave scrambled eggs or pan. Pan is always better, in my no. opinion. No, 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 no. This is one of the... Are we ever going to agree the, on anything? The modern microwave scrambled egg is so much nicer than the pan. It doesn't get creamy enough. Yeah, it's lovely. So you've got a big pile of scrambled egg yeah. on toast. Yeah. Uh, what sauce do you reach for? Ketchup. Red or Ketchup. brown? Ketchup. 
Oh, we're going to agree. Uh, you're on that one. Yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't have brown sauce oh. with scrambled egg. I suppose we have to agree sometimes. Yeah, maybe. So what about... Okay, baked beans, because they're interesting, right? Cause they're baked, already in tomato baked sauce. Baked beans come in sauce, yeah. pre-prepared, but a little dash of brown <laughs> brings the whole thing to life. No, 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 oh, no. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're not on that one. No. Tabasco. Oh, no, I'm not allowed Tabasco. I'm not allowed anything. I wasn't allowed mustard last week, so no. you just have to have it. No. Uh, Tabasco. Okay. Mm. Mm. Many other so we'll get, we'll get we'll get this app up, yeah. Yeah, we'll try to. Yeah, we'll have to come up with a long list. Yes, because I'm sure this is going to be yes. tweet rocketing uh, to the top of the app store. I would have thought it, it's got a chance for Christmas 2015. Um, so send us a tweet uh, at hashbang TV uh, with the food that you need to question whether you have red or brown sauce on. T-shirts. I I've look. I failed. You have completely failed. I only have two T-shirts. What is t-shirts. that? Some sort of cardigan. Just yeah. It's my goth cardigan. All goth that. cardigan. It's making me look thinner. Is it? Yeah. On the camera. Maybe. We'll let the audience decide that, shall we? <laughs> okay. So how's what, the sushi going? So, yeah, I'm not, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. not so well this what, week. What was those through? Eat more sushi. No, Japanese music. Read read more, su- read more, more Japanese sushi. sushi. What? No, I don't know. No. Anyway, what's weird though is I've stopped eating sushi, but my clout score hasn't gone back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's know. good. Yeah, you have to watch episode one to get that joke really. Yeah. Um, we'll try not to do too many in jokes. We'll try not to. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But this Unless t-shirt. So this t-shirt is uh, is a Radiohead t-shirt from 2001. Uh, South Park in Oxford, homecoming. Uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> I bought it. I bought it from uh, Radio had a great website called Waste uh, Waste dot com or Waste dot co uk, um, and you can you can go and buy loads of old stuff and pretend you were there. Oh, okay, which is kind of what I do with all that stuff. So yeah, I had a young kid then, uh, you know, didn't right. really. So uh, you're one of these people that walk around saying, "Yeah, I saw Radiohead in a pub." Yes. So yeah, well, why not a T-shirt then? Is it because nobody sent you a Windows 95 T-shirt? It's a protest. Is, yeah. It, yeah. The lack of. It's a blackout. It's it, a bit like the sofa is. thing. It's this is sofa. your sofa protest. <laughs> That's You're exactly not wearing. It. Yeah. Yeah. I'm blacked You've out. just thought of that, haven't you? I have. Just and I'm as I was play saying that for mine. it. Yeah. 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 Well done. Um, so yeah. next week, please try yeah, and yeah, uh, I will get wear a t-shirt. something. I need to start buying T-shirts because I don't have enough pretend yeah. T-shirts that I've been to things. <laughs> so waste.co.uk is the place to go. Obviously. Yeah. I once bought a bunch of cups, Radiohead cups from their from their Kid A tour. I've still cups. got some. Yeah, like pint cups that you'd buy from the bar. Radiohead branded everything uh, that that happened at their concerts. I thought they were anti-corporate. Um, well, that was it. It was no logo. It was their logo, right? So they wouldn't let. Even though Budweiser was running the bar, oh, they okay. so that and and they have all of that stuff. That's why it's called waste. They they sell all of their stuff that comes back from a tour on this site. Uh, um, so I bought these cups. Different. I went through a period of being drunk and buying stuff off of waste.co.uk, <laughs> as you do when you're a fan of a band that has a load of shit to give away. Right. Um, so I ended up with parcels. Yeah, I've got T-shirts that don't fit me because I bought them when I was pissed. I thought, yeah, medium will be all right. <laughs> I can't wear it. I'm waiting for my son to get into Radiohead. Okay. Which I don't think he ever will because they're depressing. They are. Anyway, so, so we're ending the show, show. <laughs> yeah. on a positive note. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, hope you're not all falling off your chairs at home. Yeah, it's been a good, good, good show though. <laughs> Joe was good, right? Joe was talked about mobile yeah, Monday. Yeah, interesting times. So our challenge is to bring you guests every week, and we're working hard on that. Yeah. And a, actually, a really positive response. Very from much people. so. Yeah, we've so, got yeah. a list now. Um, but keep keep recommending uh, different people who you want to see in that chair. Which they can't see because <laughs> <Yeah, well, laughs> the camera go. angle has changed. Yeah. But yeah, okay, so that's <laughs> Professional good. Professional to the end. Yeah. Excellent. So until next time. Yes, okay. it's a wrap. Good one. <laughs>